All right. Um, if you are going to listen or uh, hear any kind of expert or interview leading up to the next election that might give you some insight into nuclear energy, this is the one you need to listen to. Um, go on to your episodes after this interview is over and download it to your device and spread it to your people. The debate on nuclear power in Australia has continued since Peter Dutton, the opposition leader, launched his party's policy in June. Now, this month, for instance, the Daily Telegraph in Sydney had a big font headline, Let Us Nuke Power Bills. Other media, such as the ABC, which continued to dismiss nuclear power, well, I think they're clearly wrong. How can you dismiss something that you haven't done your due diligence on yet? And that's why we should listen to the real experts, and my next guest is certainly one of them. In the Australian context, I would hazard a guess that he's probably the best there is. Dr. A.D. Patterson is a scientist and engineer, widely regarded as a leading figure in nuclear science and technology. He was CEO of the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, ANSTO. That was from 2009 to 2020. Um, that's, of course, who runs the Lucas Heights reactor in Sydney. Prior to this role, AD is best known for his work on leading research and development of a pebble bed modular reactor in South Africa. He received the Australian Nuclear Association Award for 2020 for his outstanding contribution to nuclear science and technology in this country. He joins us live from Sydney. AD Patterson, welcome to TNT. It's good to be with you. I've been trying to get you on the program for some time and I've been following very closely the things that you have been saying to friendly press and not so friendly press. Why is nuclear power so important for the future of Australia? It's critically important because nuclear power, although it sounds like it's expensive when you um, put up the reactors, now often people use the phrase, takes too long, costs too much. But when you switch on the electricity, the price drops dramatically. So Finland is a good example. They built a, a nuclear reactor. It was expensive. It, it took longer than they expected. But when they switched on the electricity, the price of electrons went down to 30% of what it had been. Now, what happens, I think, in the debate in Australia, people talk about the upfront costs. But the great benefit of nuclear is that it's always on. Mm. and that it's very reliable and it adds to the quality of electricity. So we don't get the inverter-based, um, uh, what I call sawtooth electricity, that you have in uh, already in our meters. You get that reliable 50 hertz electricity. It's firm electricity. It stabilizes the grid. It's a shorter grid uh, because you can actually put the nuclear power plants where we've got existing coal plants, for example, and therefore, you don't have to double the size of the grid. <clears throat> and the lie that we're being told is a very simple lie, is that uh, nuclear, you know, is too expensive. Um, but they forget to tell us that we will have to double the size of the grid to build all of the renewables that we need to build. Now, the cost of the, the, the grid in our bill is about 40 to 60 percent of what we pay at the meter for electricity. If we double the size of the grid, that'll go from about probably um, 45 to 75% of the cost of our electricity. So doubling the size of the grid is a non-trivial thing as well. Uh, we'll have to do that in regional and rural Australia. At the same time, we still have to build all of the renewables that we have not yet built that they want to. The price of that is twice the price of building the nuclear power plants. Grid extension plus the completion of the renewables is twice as costly just at the capital level than the nuclear. And the nuclear will, from the experience of, of Finland, reduce the price of electricity. Germany did this experiment. Their electricity is now twice the price of France when they started the experiment with their 24 nuclear power plants operating, they were pretty much on parity. So Germany's already done what Australia's trying to do. They shut down 24 beautiful nuclear power plants uh, because of irrational fear. France has kept their 64 plants operating and uh, they have got half the price of Germany. So the facts are clear. At the meter where you and I pay for electricity, 
nuclear is the best thing that you can have. A couple of quick things about what you've said. I've never known an infrastructure discussion or debate where the length of time it takes to get to the end game and build the infrastructure is an issue. Um, we, yeah. we, we, like we, we build West Connex and things like this around the Sydney metro area. It's still not finished after 15 years. I, I'm not quite sure why they, they use the, 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 the time and the capital cost. I mean, the government could buy us all bicycles and we could ride to work. <laughs> um, you know, that would be cheaper than building building a metro rail, for example, or a high-speed rail, uh, you know, between Canberra and Sydney, for example. Um, and so, but the basic uh, debate um, and, and and you know, Admiral Bowen, as I call him, who's always looking out to sea for wind turbines, um, you know, his, his nature of this debate is, is basically fear. Yeah. You know, this is going to be really dangerous. And ignorance. Yeah. Uh, ignorance, and it costs a lot. Well, it doesn't cost a lot. And the great thing about nuclear is it's got a tiny footprint. The footprint for nuclear is tiny. The waste issue is already sorted in Australia for our existing waste. Uh, this wonderful company, TELUS, which is based in Sydney, has built a, a waste repository for low and intermediate level waste, which yep. is pretty much nearly all of it. Yep. Um, in WA, that is open and is accepting waste. Yep. Pretty much all of the intermediate level waste uh, from Ansto could go there immediately if there weren't transport bans all across the, 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 the Sydney metropolitan district uh, because people are frightened of having, they're quite happy to have nuclear medicine go past them every day uh, <laughs> to, to treat their diseases and to, and to do their diagnoses. Uh, but the, you know, the transport bans that are in place and so on. So, so we're living in the 1980s. Yes. Um, with the aspirations to be, you know, a, a modern uh, science-based nation, um, uh, that, you know, no longer just the lucky country, but the smart country. Um, but we're, we're leaving out the possibility of having the most reliable power in the smallest footprint with the most predictable jobs. And the thing that I can't understand uh, for the people on the left is all of the quality union jobs that are associated with nuclear around the world. I mean, it's typically highly unionised. Yep. It's the top end of town from the point of view of the electricals and the mechanicals and the, the operators and so on. So it, it's almost the opposite of what you would expect a modern Labour government to want to do, like, yep. like the UK or, or the Finnish Labour governments. Yeah, that's very, very true. Talking about Admiral Bowen, uh, the Minister for Climate Change, the climate clown himself, Chris Bowen, made specific reference to nuclear power plans for Australia in a speech he made on July 17 to the National Press Club. I just want to play a clip from that. Have a listen to this. Choice for the Australian people over the next 12 months. Our plans, based on the expert work of the CSIRO through GenCost and AEMO's Integrated System Plan, all the alternative of an uncosted, unexplained and undeliverable nuclear plan for Australia. The opposition blithely, and I must say arrogantly, ignores the data and facts from experts about the time and cost to build a nuclear industry for Australia and presents, therefore, a false future. On the basis of what he's saying, and he keeps using the CSIRO Gen Cost report on nuclear and renewables, is it fair to say that the CSIRO Gen Cost report is the greatest con you've ever seen out of that organisation? In fact, uh, I've spoken to them many times about it, but they don't listen. I call it the Gen Con report because it's a con. Yeah. Um, the, it is the cost at the fence as calculated um, by the, the CSIRO who have no experts, they've never consulted me. And the worst thing is, is that they are using a dated, very high number, a single number from a plant that was never constructed. <laughs> so so this, it, it literally is embarrassing. Yeah. There are really good, really good published scientific research in published journals that show that nuclear is much, much cheaper than solar much, much cheaper than wind at the metre where the customer pays. Yes, and, and uh, uh, Ari, while we're, while we're on that, just before you leave that, mm -hmm. that the whole premise of the CSIRO, a group of scientists doing an accountant's job, defies logic to me. This should have been the job of KPMG. 
it, in fact, they outsource a, a, a lot of the electrical <clears throat> uh, grid work to a consultancy which they've had for many years. It's about 10 spreadsheets. You can look at the spreadsheets. They just uh, lists of figures. And out of that, they, they developed this mystery tour. Yeah. Mystery tour. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the Australian public needs to understand uh, that the parameters that we use to start working out what renewables would cost, for instance, have not included the total cost of renewables and the parameters used, as you rightly say in that last answer, for nuclear power were just based on crook approximations. Very much so. And it's the cost of the fence. It's the cost before the grid. Um, and that's, so, uh, you know, that's what the gen cost uh, report is. But the, the cost at the meter, yeah. um, you have, you know, wind turbines are only available two days out of five on average. Yeah. But the gen cost reports are at cost as, as if they're available 100% of the time. So it's a con on two levels. Uh, which is, you know, the electricity cost to the consumer in their um, in their business, in their factory, in their data centre, in their home, uh, versus the, the the cost of the fence before it gets onto the grid. And so, I don't think anybody should should listen to CSIRO. They're not experts. The no. people who report together are an economist and a wave power specialist, or two of them. Yeah, very very true. Uh, what upsets me about this is that we've we're thinking, as you say. In the 80s, we're thinking almost backward, ignorantly, um, when we should be looking at the data that's available about how the rest of the world cope with nuclear. That's what we should be doing. And the other thing that makes me so frustrated, and it must make you frustrated, are the huge deposits of uranium. And while we're talking about uranium, maybe thorium as well, which is another source of energy that we could use. Absolutely. The, the, the bans on uranium exploration and mining in New South Wales are terrible. Uh, so you're not even allowed to trip over a rock with uranium in and pick it up and have a look at it. So that's how bad the bans are in New South Wales. So we've got layers of bans and uh, we have got some of the best potential deposits. We know that from uh, geological work that has been done. And we've got 45% of the, the whole of global uranium uh, in the world uh, on in Australian soil, yeah. so so it's just a tragedy for not just for us but for the world that we are not getting into the fuel cycle. You know, just even even fuel fabrication is a massively important business. Um, there are very few people in the free world doing it, and we could be we could really add to that. And then the waste deposits, the storage of waste, we could do it from you know birth to death. This whole process, couldn't we? Exactly. The, the Synroc process um, for, uh, you know, waste from nuclear medicine has been developed at Anstow. It was done during the time that I was there. That was a dream when I joined, and we now have a validated uh, process for, for you for dealing with the nuclear medicine waste, uh, putting it into Synroc, which was invented by Ted, Ted Ringwood, Ringwood at, uh, at ANU many, many years ago. Yeah. But I made the commitment to Ziggy Swakowski that I would either stop and rock forever or get the first plant built, and it was being finished as I left Anstow. Yeah. Given your experience in pebble bed modular reactor design in South Africa, surely modular designed reactors are perfectly suited to the landscape of a sparse nation like Australia. Exactly right. Um, and all of the Generation 3 plus uh, plants, whether they're the big ones or the smaller ones, um, <clears throat> have got modular designs. They are built very efficiently. And for Australian companies, they would be able to get into the supply chain for the construction. So we're not just talking about the, the companies who would benefit from constructing it, but those who would actually service them over their uh, 60 to 80 year life. Uh, wind turbines last maybe 25 to 30 years, solar panels maybe 25 years. Um, but nuclear power reactors are already certified in parts of, of the world up to 60 years, and they'll certainly get to 80 years. And what we've got to realise is, and please jump on this and, and answer the question for me, but ever since Chernobyl, there have been changes to both the technology and the way we monitor reactors Absolutely. That, that have that that make it one of the safest energy industries in the world yeah <clears throat> all of the accidents that we talk about whether it's uh 
Chernobyl, where, where um, you know, as a reactor was never built in the West, it was a Soviet reactor, or Three Mile Island, which was a Generation 2 reactor. We're now talking about Generation 3 plus reactors. Yeah. The safety cases are fundamentally uh, improved. Uh, they, uh, in fact, some of the new reactors, the safety design of the reactor is the building of the reactor or the fence of the facility. Whereas previously the safety design was a number of kilometers outside. So it's fundamentally changed. And the chance of a generation three or generation three plus reactor, or even better generation four reactors, we are in fact members of the generation four international forum, which is looking at those reactors. Um, those reactors will really be able to have incredibly good safety cases, much more uh, flexibility than the current reactors. But anybody who builds a, a Korean AP-1400 or an AP-1000 um, uh, from, from Westinghouse is going to get a world-class reactor. They can be built as they have been in the Emirates uh, between six and eight years. Uh, and you can go from uh, first concrete to connection to the grid within 12 years. How do the economics stack up? Now, I'm saying this in light of, and I want to, I want you to refer to this specifically. Every 15 years, they're going to have to replace these thousands and thousands of wind turbines, uh, whether they're onshore or offshore. But these nuclear reactors will be around for 100 years, won't they? Yeah, I think by the time we build these, these Generation 3 Plus reactors, they'll certainly be certified for 60 to 80 years. Uh, the, the new US fleet is is being built on, on, on the economics of 60 years plus 20. Mm -hmm. But the economics now, as we speak today, is already better for large-scale nuclear plants and most small modular reactors than wind and solar by a factor of two. Yeah. Um, and, and the people are mixing up capital cost. A cheap wind turbine, uh, which is going to spend its time murdering birds and bats and, and uh, you know, generally being bad for the environment with, yeah. with the blade flash and so on that, that people have to endure, uh, versus a safe nuclear plant with quality jobs that is going to be around for a very long period of time um, and which literally disappear into the landscape. People get used to them. Uh, the closest uh, nuclear power plant that I know to the centre of a city that everybody knows about is the Kuburg plant, which is 8.5 kilometres in the linear distance from the centre of Cape Town. Yeah. Nobody knows it's there. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's got pumped hydro on the one side and it's got Kuburg on the other side, and those are the two primary forms of energy for the city of Cape Town. Many people listening now will have been to Cape Town and probably didn't know same here. I've been to Cape Town. I didn't know it all. Two beautiful French reactors built in the 1980s. I did um, inspections of the of the seismic bearings. That means that it can take any sort of earthquake that they could think of in Cape Town. Uh, as a student in in the early 1980s, uh, when they were still building it, so I've been underneath Kuburg before it was built, and I was recently in South Africa and went to the beach, literally four kilometres away from where the plant is and had a beautiful day on the beach. There's nothing scary about nuclear once you have got a good regulatory regime, uh, a responsible government, um, and, and there is no better way. And we know this uh, globally, the International Energy Agency, uh, the number of, uh, of, of, um, of uh, injuries and deaths from nuclear is the lowest of any form of power. And that includes wind and solar. There are more people who get, you know, hit at the gate or have a wind turbine blade fall on their head than uh, get hurt in nuclear power plants. It's robust, it's reliable, it's always on. The sun goes down at night and the wind blows two days out of, uh, two days out of five. We are betting the Australian future on these two forms of energy which literally do not stack up. There's published scientific and engineering research that says it does not stack up. Exactly. It's a crazy bet. It is. I've run out of time. I wish we could have another half hour, but I uh, would request that we get you back here and talk again before the end of the year. Fantastic to have you on the program. Thank you very much for your insight. Great pleasure to be there. Fantastic, Professor Ari Patterson. That's the interview. You've got to download onto your device and send to your friends and family. This is Chris Smith on TNT.news.